The, that music was speaking to us of the sufferings of our Savior and the way that they provide a way of guidance for us through the sufferings and struggles of our own lives. It's such an appropriate preparation for looking together at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and I want to speak with you this morning about suffering and its place in the Christian life. Now, maybe your carefree existence as a college student has left you untouched by suffering, but maybe not. Maybe you're more like me. Just in the past few weeks, and I just made a list here of some of the forms of brokenness I've been dealing with, chronic illness, life or death, life-threatening illness, depression, anxiety, betrayal, broken relationships, destructive sins, the grief of death. Some of these are my struggles, and some of them are the struggles of the people I love. And so I can relate to the Wheaton alumna who was in a serious accident and through a long period of struggle wrote about the days, she said, when you feel like a quivering, cowardly shell of yourself, when despair yawns as a terrible chasm, when fear paralyzes any chance for pleasure. Maybe you can relate to those experiences. Maybe some of your prayers are like my prayers. Help me, Jesus. That comes up a lot in my prayer life. Or prayers from the Gospels, like, have mercy on us, son of David. At times like this, it is encouraging to me to reflect on some of the lessons I have learned from the Scottish theologian Thomas Boston, who pastored a little country church in the early 1700s, not too far from the city of Edinburgh. And to put this man's sufferings into context, let me just give you this one fact that out of the 10 children who were born to Thomas and his wife Catherine, six died in their infancy. One loss was especially tragic. Boston had already lost a son named Ebenezer, which in the Bible means thus far has the Lord helped us, but that child died. And yet when his wife was expecting another child, the thought came to Boston, well, maybe I could name this child Ebenezer as well. What a testimony of faith that I would be able to say, yes, the Lord helped us to this point. Now he's even helped us to this point. But he also thought, what if this child died too? What if we had to bury another Ebenezer? That would be a loss too bitter to bear. And yet in faith, when the child was born, Boston decided to name his son Ebenezer. The child was sickly. Despite the urgent prayers of his parents, he never recovered. After such a heavy loss, I think many people would be tempted to accuse God of wrongdoing, abandon their faith, at least drop out of ministry for a while. But that is not what Thomas Boston did. He believed in the goodness as well as the sovereignty of God. And so, Rather than turning away from the Lord in time of trouble, he turned towards him for help and comfort. In fact, his testimony at that time was that this time he had a greater sense of God's communion, of the presence of the Holy Spirit comforting him. Later, Boston wrote a classic sermon on the sovereignty of God, and he gave it, to the, gave it this title, which is my title this morning. It's kind of old-timey, but the title goes like this, The Crook in the Lot. And it was based on the command and question that we have in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 13, our main focus this morning. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Now, there's a command here. It's the command to consider, to make some careful observation of the ways of God in the world. And if you've been paying attention at all this year to our series in Ecclesiastes, you know that the Solomon who wrote this book was a very careful student of the work of God in the world. He studied the seasons of life when it was time for this and time for that. He watched the way that people worked and played. He saw how they lived and died. And here in chapter 7, he invites us to consider God's work in the world. And with that command comes a rhetorical question, who can straighten out what God has made crooked? 
The answer, of course, is no one. Things are, in some ultimate sense, the way God wants them to be. We do not have the ability to overrule the Almighty. Now, when the preacher talks here about something crooked, he's not talking about something immoral. He's talking about some trouble we have in life that we wish we could change but cannot alter. And sooner or later, all of us have things like that in life, physical limitations perhaps, the breakdown of some personal or family relationship. There's something you have in your life that you wish you didn't have or something you wish you did have in your life and you don't. Sooner or later, there's something that you wish, you wish to God would have a different shape to it. I wonder, what is the one thing in your life that you could change if you could change anything in your life? Well, as the preacher reflected on this theme, he recognized that God has a different situation for everyone in life. It's what Thomas Boston in those days, and sometimes we use this expression today as well, he would have called it your lot in life. Here's how he, in his sermon, here's how he talked about it. He said, there's a certain train or course of events by the providence of God falling to every one of us during our life in this world, and that is our lot, allotted to us by the sovereign God. And the reality is that we all have things we wish we could change. And Boston wrote about that as well. He said, in that train or course of events, some events fall out cross to us against the grain. These are the things that make the crook in our lot. While we're here, there will be cross events as well as agreeable ones in our lot. Sometimes things are softly and agreeably gliding on. Maybe that was your spring break, I don't know. But by and by, there is some incident which alters that course and pains us. There is no perfection here. Everybody's lot in this world has some crook in it. Now. When people hear Kohelet, the author of Ecclesiastes, say this, they assume he's a fatalist. Some people reach that conclusion. Some things are straight in life, other things are crooked. Whether they're crooked or straight, there's nothing you can do about it. It all comes down to fate or maybe predestination. But there's another way to look at these verses. The preacher is saying that whether things seem crooked or straight, we need to see our situation in terms of the good sovereignty of God. If there is some crook in our lot, if you want to call it that way, it's the work of God and it would be vain for us to try and change it. I think it's instructive to compare Ecclesiastes 7.13 with Ecclesiastes 1.15. Those two verses very similar, in fact, in part uh, identical. But back in Ecclesiastes 1, the preacher just says what is crooked cannot be made straight and he doesn't say anything about God at all. He's not recognizing the sovereignty of God. This is back when he was leaving God out of the picture, trying to show us how meaningless life seems without God. But here he brings God back in, looking at the world according to God, and he puts both what seem to be to us the straight things and the crooked things, both under God's care. Now, still true, there's nothing we can do to straighten out what is crooked. It's not going to change unless and until God decides he wants to change it. We don't have the power to edit God's agenda, but this doesn't drive us to despair. It gives us hope through all of the trials of life. When you trust not just in the sovereignty of God, but also in his goodness, that helps you know how to respond both to the joys and to the trials of life. It was a good prayer we had. This is, this morning, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be, be glad in it. Here's what the preacher says. It's somewhat different advice than that. It's in verse 14. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider. God has made one as well as the other. That puts today and every day under the sovereignty of God. Some days full of prosperity. The the temperature is above freezing, if you can imagine it. You still have thunderbucks in your account. All is right with the world. If you have homework to do from uh, leftover from spring break, it's for the class you enjoy the most. I mean, it's that kind of day. 
Every day, with that kind of goodness, every delicious meal, every financial windfall, every meaningful conversation, every blessing in life, whatever it is of any kind, it's a gift of God's grace that calls you to joy. And now, Ecclesiastes is far too realistic to think that every day is going to be like that. Some days are full of adversity rather than prosperity. The sun is not shining. The birds are not singing. Nothing seems right with the world. In fact, maybe for you, it looks like your trials will never end. And you wonder if you have even one true friend in the world. If you have a day like that, it too comes under the sovereignty of God. The preacher doesn't have the heart here to tell you to be joyful on such a difficult day, but he does call us to consider the ways of God and to recognize that this too is a day that the Lord has made. Something happens when you entrust every day of your life to the loving care of a sovereign God. There's a sense in which you are ready for anything. In his comments on this verse, Martin Luther advised, enjoy the things that are present in such a way that you do not base your confidence on them as if they were going to last forever, but reserve part of your heart for God so that you can bear the day of adversity. I don't know what trials you may face in your life. You may not be facing any particular trials right now. Sooner or later, you will. And if you receive this day as a gift from God, but don't put your confidence in the goodness of this day, but put your confidence in God himself, you will be ready to bear through the day of adversity. It's all part of what it means to consider the work of God. It's not just seeing what God has done. It's accepting what God has done, surrendering to his sovereign will, praising him, for every prosperity and trusting him through every adversity. Now, maybe that seems a little simplistic to you, a little too easy, a little tied up together, maybe something you say in theology class, but then wonder how it really works in life. And if that's the way you feel about about what the preacher says so far, you can probably relate to what he says next because In the very next verse, you can see him struggling with God's sovereignty. You have to remember, this author is absolutely committed to telling us the total truth about life. And here's something true about life. It can be desperately unfair. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There's that word vanity again. The preacher says, there is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in evil doing. It's exactly the opposite of what most people expect. It's certainly the opposite of what you think would be fair. The the righteous people are the ones that ought to be rejoicing in their prosperity, while the wicked suffer adversity until finally they admit that God is in control. That's, That's the way we might want to see it. But what we see instead often is what the preacher saw, righteous people dying before their time, Their enemies keeping on living. Godly pastors are martyred for their faith and their persecutors live to terrorize the church another day. These are the kinds of things that happen in this world and sometimes you say it's just not fair. In fact, we looked at this issue of injustice in our last time together in Ecclesiastes. There are some crooked things in life, maybe in your life, maybe in somebody else's life, maybe in the world generally that you wish you could straighten out. And yet, as he struggles with the reality of life in a fallen world, the preacher gives this practical advice. I wonder what you think of it. Be not overly righteous. Don't make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked. Neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Some scholars believe these verses are rather cynical, and maybe they are. Uh, Maybe the preacher is saying something like this, if only the good die young, don't bother being a goody two-shoes. You don't want to have anything come after you. And that's that's the way some people think today. They may be no better than to live a, a life of total wickedness because deep down they really do believe there is a God who might judge people, but they suspect that trying to be holy will take the fun out of life. And so they hope they're good enough to get by on the day of judgment. As long as they're not too righteous or 
too wicked, they are happy just the way they are. If that's what the preacher means here, I suspect he may be thinking at life, looking at life under the sun again, leaving God out of the picture and just thinking about good and evil the way an unbeliever might think about them just in earthly terms. There's another way to look at this verse, and I somewhat prefer it when he tells us not to be overly righteous. I think he's telling us not to be self-righteous. The form of the verb that he uses here may refer to someone who is only pretending to be righteous. It's actually a kind of hypocrisy, seeming to be better than you really are. Besides, if God's standard is perfection, if we're called to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, then how could anyone ever be too righteous? How could you ever be overly righteous in that sense? No, our usual problem is thinking that we are more righteous than we really are. And so the preacher gives us this advice. He says, don't be, so to speak, too righteous, and certainly never think that you are too good to suffer, that it would be unfair for somebody like you to have a crook in your lot. It's tempting to say, God, I, I really don't deserve this. Don't you know who I am or maybe what I've done for you? And it's a pretty short step from there to saying, who does God think he is? Now, not that we should be unrighteous. There's a balance here in this verse. He's not saying here it's okay to be a little bit wicked as if there was some acceptable level of iniquity. His point rather is that there is great danger in giving ourselves over to sin. It's one thing to fall into sin from time to time as everyone does, then to repent of sin and get back up and try to serve the Lord again. And the preacher will say as much in verse 20, there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins, but there's a world of difference between committing the occasional regretful sin and making a deliberate decision to pursue a lifestyle of theft and deception and lust and greed. Could it be that someone here this morning needs to hear that warning, a warning from the Spirit of God not to give your life over to some particular sin? There is grace for you, strength in the Holy Spirit. And the preacher is saying here, don't be a fool if you live for sin you will perish. And so there are two dangers here. There's self-righteousness and there's unrighteousness. And frankly, both of those are a real temptation for Wheaton College. And both errors lead to destruction. They may even lead to an untimely death. It's not going to happen all the time, but it certainly does happen sometimes. And there's a way to avoid both of those dangers, and that is to live in the fear of God. The preacher gives this hopeful word in verse 18, for the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. I think referring back to these dangers described in verses 16 and 17, the dangers of self-righteousness and unrighteousness. We are called to fear God. That's going to become increasingly an important theme in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's holding God in awe for his majestic beauty. Some of the themes that we were singing about earlier, the inaccessibility, the immortality, the invisibility of God. You start wrestling with those kinds of attributes. You are filled with awe. You have respect for his mighty and his awesome power. And when you really do fear God more than anything else in life, it will help you look beyond present trials and see the work of God and accept the work of God, even the crooked things, until he chooses to make them straight. Earlier, I mentioned Thomas Boston and his classic sermon on Ecclesiastes 7.13, The Crook in the Lot. And Boston ended his sermon just by listing some of the reasons why God makes some things crooked. These are biblical lessons, and Boston had confirmed them through his own experience of grief and pain. Why is it that God leaves some things crooked in life, even when you pray for him to make them straight? I want to just mention some of these reasons very quickly. Here's one. Boston says, sometimes the crooked things in life are a test to help determine whether we really are holding on to Christ for our salvation. Job's a good example of that, afflicted with many painful trials in order to prove the genuineness of his faith. 
Some of our own sufferings may have the same purpose. By the grace of God, they confirm that we are holding on to Jesus. I'm not sure that's a reason we often think of why God might bring affliction into our lives. Here's a, another reason Thomas Boston talked about. He said, whatever crooks we have in our earthly lot, turn our hearts away from the vanity of this world and teach us to look for happiness in the life to come. Whenever we go through suffering, it's part of our preparation for eternity. I think, for example, of the prodigal son who did not head for home and to his father until he had lost everything he had. Maybe this is one of the reasons we go through crooked things in life. We're, God is teaching us to look for the day when he will make things straight. Sometimes the crooked things in life convict us of our sins. It's not always the case that God is judging us through our trials, but sometimes it is. And the Holy Spirit, in any case, can use our trials to touch our conscience, to remind us of some particular sin we need to confess. It would be a mistake to think that all our sufferings are a judgment for our sins, but it would also be a mistake to miss out on the opportunity that suffering brings to repent for unconfessed sin. Well, there's so many other things the crooked things in life can do. They can correct us for our sins. Sometimes God allows us to suffer in a particular way that keeps us from committing a sin or maybe to reveal a sinful attitude that would only be revealed if we went through such deep suffering. Or maybe God puts a crook into your lot to display his grace in your godliness under trial. These are some of the reasons we may face suffering in life. And the point of listing them isn't so much to help you figure out exactly why it is that you are going through some particular trial. Most of the time we don't know, although sometimes, particularly in retrospect, we can see it. I think the real point is to remember that whatever the reason, God has put it there. When something in life seems crooked, it's easy to tell God how he should straighten things out. But maybe part of what God wants to do is to straighten us out. And whenever we are having trouble believing that God really does know what he's doing, I think we should consider the work of our Savior. Our good shepherd once had a crook in his lot. It was a crook that came in the shape of a cross. And in a sense, our Savior asked the Father, this was part of his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, if there was any, to, any way to make Calvary straight instead of crooked. But there was no other way. God had a purpose in that crooked cross, a purpose of atonement for sin, through a sin bearer offering perfect atonement in our place, an atonement for sin that would lead to eternal life. And so Jesus suffered the crooked cross, that it was his God-given lot to bear. And he trusted the Father through that suffering, waiting for him to straighten things out when the time was right by raising him up on the third day. And so the scripture says to us this morning, consider the work of God. Don't try to straighten out but he has made crooked. And our Savior says to us this morning, when you do consider the work of God, remember most of all my love for you through the crooked cross and trust our Father to make things straight in his good time. Let me pray for us this morning. Our Father in heaven, this room represents many heavy trials. Many of us can testify to the sufferings of life. Many of us are burdened by the sufferings of those we love. Some of us may face unexpected suffering, and we need to be prepared for that day of trial. Help us to consider your work. Help us, Father, to trust not only in your sovereignty, but also in your goodness. Help us to hold on to Jesus and onto the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen.